are the main aims. Staging of chronic liver disease and screening for early diagnosis. But what is important is that in main, many fields of ultrasonography, we have really strong advances. So, diagnosis of liver cirrhosis with conventional ultrasound. This probably is well known to all of you. We have strictly hepatic findings, liver profiles, echo texture, morphology and size, and extrahepatic findings. Lymph nodes, gallbladder, bile ducts, spleen, vessels, abdominal fluid. Liver profiles are the most important finding for the diagnosis of cirrhosis in compensated liver disease. And uh, we could show this in this prospective study assessing patients with compensated liver disease. So there was no clinical suspicion of cirrhosis. Clearly, you can use even high frequency probes, but even by conventional probe, you, could you can easily demonstrate irregular profile and where it there is a site is even frank nodular profile. Echo texture, which is the coarse pattern and morphology in size, in enlargement of the left lobe, enlargement of the whole liver, are important, but they are not a reproducible, as reproducible as the nodular profile, and thus are less specific. And this is also for lymph nodes and gallbladder and bile ducts. They are poorly useful for diagnosis of cirrhosis. The spleen, when it is enlarged, is a clue to make a diagnosis, but it, is, it does only confirm other findings because itself is not specific of cirrhosis. It might be found enlarged in many other diseases. And the same is for the abdominal fluid. It has a relevance only once we know that the patient has cirrhosis. But if ascites is the first manifestation, that it might be a cancer or many other diseases. So these are less important than the liver profiles. Splenoportal vessels are important, but mainly when we assess them with Doppler. I will go through this later. So the main key feature for ultrasound diagnosis of cirrhosis is the finding of a nodular profile. One interesting point is the assessment of hepatic fibrosis. This is the final common result of a wide variety of liver injuries. And it's very important to assess how much fibrosis is there because progressive fibrosis predicts progression to cirrhosis in HCV patients. So we know how many years we will expect to have the patient cirrhotic. And fibrosis, the extent of fibrosis may predict the clinical decompensation and the complications of liver disease. So to establish a prognosis for an individual patient, with viral chronic liver disease, it is important to know how much fibrosis is there. This is the common final point of arrival of many different diseases. From a histological point of view, there are different scoring systems which have different numbers from 0 to 4, from 1 to 6. The most commonly utilized in HIV patients is the metaverse stage, which goes from no fibrosis, F0, to established cirrhosis, which is F4. Usually F0 and F1 are considered as uh, no clinically meaningful fibrosis. F3 and F4, clearly clinically relevant fibrosis. And uh, F2 is considered to be already somehow significant fibrosis. When it is important to make the quantification, as I told you, and when it is important to make a biopsy. Biopsy is absolutely necessary when you need information on grading, how much inflammatory activity is there, but also when you need an etiological diagnosis, like in case of steatohepatitis, autoimmune disease, primary biliary cirrhosis, or after liver transplantation, because you have to establish whether there is a rejection or not. So in all these cases, we need the quantification of fibrosis, but we need biopsy. However, biopsy is invasive, it has potential serious complication, and it's subjected to sampling errors. And there is intra-observer viability. So there is a great interest in evaluation of non-invasive measurement of liver fibrosis when fibrosis assessment is the main or maybe the unique information requested from biopsy. So if we have let's say, in HIV patients that we know that etiology is viral, 
uh, transaminases are not very high, so probably the activity is low, we make a biopsy only to state how much fibrosis is there, the similarly for HBV. So in these cases, it would be important to have alternative measurements. I want to stress a little bit the limitations of the biopsy, of the sampling errors. The smallest the bioptic specimen, the largest the risk of underestimation. This is uh, an optical view at microscope of a piece of the liver, where you see that this is a cirrhotic patient. But let's say that if the needle was smaller, it was not a 1.4 millimeter needle, but it was 0.8, from this same patient, you might have said that the patient has no or minimal fibrosis. Same patient, just putting the needle somewhere else. If by chance, and this would be minimal fibrosis, instead, if the needle had fallen just along the fibrous tissue, we would say the patient has cirrhosis, correct diagnosis. If we had taken just a smaller piece of the liver, then it would become a serious fibro a severe fibrosis, but not cirrhosis, F3. And in this case, we would have get F4. So you see that with the same patients, according to how long is the specimen that we get, how thick it is, and by chance where it goes, we might have different diagnoses. And this is well known that the risk of underestimation of bi when, when performing biopsy. So this is one additional reason to have other tools to make an estimation of fibrosis because of the potential risk, but also of the limitation of biopsy. So there are many tests that have been assessed to uh, make a, the assessment of fibrosis. This is a panel of laboratory markers. They um, have the availability is limited. You have to pay, for instance, to have the fibro test. They may be useful, but are not still so reliable. Imaging in this review, and ultrasound included, is accepted as a reliable technique, but may be helpful especially in advanced cases, as I've shown, it's very good to say there is cirrhosis or not, but it's not very good to say there is no or severe fibrosis. So all these laboratory-based non-invasive assessments are prone to many limitations which are due to laboratory value flu fluctuations. Transaminases are not the same every day, for instance, and transaminases are included in all the panels of uh, test. The re inter laboratory variability, and they are not accurate in discriminating intermediate stage. The background for utilizing elastometry is that in the past, to say that the liver was cirrhotic, we palpated it. We say, okay, this is a hard liver, then it is cirrhotic. The first assessment using ultrasound, we are talking about this because all these new techniques are ultrasound based, was published seven years ago and is, it was the pioneer study on transient elastography, the equipment that's called FibroScan. You see this equipment which has a tip this is an ultrasound based technique, this is a vibrator it gives one stroke to the intercostal space and then on the tip there is an ultrasound transducer and what it does is that after let's say this stroke on the skin uh, this generates a compression of the underlying structure so when you put it in the costal space the underlying structure is delivered and then the ultrasound probes measure how fast does this compression runs within the liver. So this is the distance and this is time. So if this uh, bar, this uh, dark bar goes in this direction, it means that uh, uh, it takes, sorry, th this is the time and this is the distance. So it, it takes a long time to reach this distance. It means that the wave that we generated runs slowly within the liver. When it runs slowly, it means that the liver is soft, it's normal. 
when this dark bar comes straight down, it means that uh, in a short time, it runs through a long space. So it lever is stiffer. And so according to the angle of this dark bar, you get a number in uh, the measurement in kilopascal of the stiffness, and these express the stiffness of the lever. 3.9 is uh, a normal liver, soft parenchyma, and is devoid of any fibrosis. So we can easily get an information on the stiffness of the liver. And then after this first demonstration, there were several clinical studies where they could easily demonstrate that the cirrhotic liver, fibrosis stage 4, had higher values of uh, stiffness, this is expressed in kilopascal, than any other stage of the disease. And you see that there was a progressive increase in stiffness according to the increase in the fibrosis deposition. No fibrosis between 5, 4 of kilopascal, and then a progressive increase with very good uh, discriminating capacity. So the area under the curve for the diagnosis of cirrhosis at biopsy, comparing it with uh, no cirrhosis, F0 to F3, is very high. And this is the for an excellent tool for the confirmation of cirrhosis. The optimal cutoff in this meta-analysis, which included thousands of patients, was a cutoff of 13 kilopascal. So if with this equipment, which has a very good inter-observer and intra-observer reproducibility, you have more than 13 kilopascal, then the likelihood of having cirrhosis is very high. On the other hand, being below 13 does not exclude cirrhosis. The main limitation is that uh, it is not very good in discriminating F2 from S3 fibrosis, which would be a very important point. On the other hand, if you have very low uh, values of stiffness, then you are sure that you have no clinically relevant uh, fibrosis. There are some limitations. Yes, sure they are. There is a certain degree of uh, interference with the inflammatory because inflammation causes edema, which increases the stiffness of the liver. So if the patient has very high transaminases, then the assessment is not completely reliable. Another limitation is that in uh, big patients, in uh, fatty patients, body mass index greater than 28, then uh, there are often cases in which you are not able to get the information, probably because the probe is too far away from the liver. This is the probable explanation. But this is also a big limitation because nowadays, you know, that fatty liver is one main cause of disease and we would like to have information on the status of the liver in these fatty liver patients. And so this is a certain limitation. In my experience, um, in cases that you are not able to get information with the standard probe, which means that you don't see the liver, you just push. Uh, if you look with ultrasonography where there is the best place and then you put the probe, you can rescue some cases. So, so nowadays, When we consider the use of ultrasound in the hand of the hepatologist and we want to assess the stage of fibrosis in a patient, we could use a combination of fibroscan and serial fibrosis index. If they agree either that there is no fibrosis or cirrhosis, then we don't need biopsy because if there is agreement between biomarkers and fibroscan, then the diagnosis is certain either of no fibrosis or of cirrhosis. If there is discrepancy, uh, sorry, if there is discrepancy, so there is no agreement, you need a biopsy. Otherwise, if there is agreement, you might judge on three different categories. Either the patient has said a cirrhosis, which is metavir stages three or mainly four, or uh, uh, Scheuer indexes uh, five or six, or the patient has minimal fibrosis or intermediate. It is not good in telling exactly the stage. 
but this also biopsy has some limitation, as I told you, but at least three different categories. Extreme fibrosis, no fibrosis, intermediate fibrosis. Then we would know, can this technique say us also how high is the portal pressure of the varices? This is not perfect, but might give some information. Varices usually occur when there is at least 17 kilopascal of uh, fibrosis and 90% uh, of the patients with uh, values higher than these have varices. It is not able at all to grade the size of the varices. And the correlation between pressure and fibrosis is, uh, and uh, stiffness is linear, very strict, up to uh, about 15, which means that from chronic hepatitis to cirrhosis, then there is a correlation. Then you know that when you have frank cirrhosis, you have collateral circulation, and so there are many other uh, factors that affect pressure together with fibrosis. It's not only fibrosis alone anymore. So this is very clear why this is happens. Then there is a recent paper, which is, I think, for hepatologists, very interesting. In Japan, they studied a very large number of cases of patients with uh, HIV infection, more than 800. Most of them were only with chronic hepatitis. You know, that in Japan, the, the risk of developing hepatocellular cancer in HCV is a little bit higher than in Europe. But what's interesting, they could demonstrate that taking as reference patients with uh, no significant fibrosis, so uh, stiffness below 10, at any increase of 5 uh, kilopascal in stiffness, there was an increase in the rate of risk of cancer. And this, even in patients with frank cirrhosis, which is above 15, usually we grade all these patients as having a risk of cancer, but we don't know whether a patient has higher or lower risk of cancer. There is no tool today. So this manuscript suggests that if you have cirrhosis, but this is not so stiff, the liver, you have a lower risk of having cancer than cirrhosis with a very high stiffness. So in the future, maybe, this will be for sure an ultrasound-based technique, very useful to assess the risk of the patients of having viruses, of developing cancer, and probably will become a common tool to assess our patient. You see that uh, the progression in the risk of cancer went from 0.4 per year, uh, uh, sorry, at three years in patients with no cirrhosis to 38% to patients with cirrhosis above 25 kilopascal. Nowadays, there is not only Fibroscan, there are other equipments. This is Virtual Touch, and this uh, is a different system for assessing uh, stiffness, which is implemented in an ultrasound scanner. So you see the liver scanning. You push a button, and you get an information on the stiffness, which is measured in velocity. The stiffness is measured where you put the box, not deeper than 5.5 centimeters. And the, in a study from our group, we could demonstrate that the correlation between the values of Fibroscan and Virtual Touch were, were, were very high, the correlation about 0.90. the area under the curve for the diagnosis of cirrhosis was as good as with a fibro scan. The threshold for cirrhosis was So this is probably new things that any of you performing ultrasonography for liver patient would use in the future. Then we want to make a diagnosis of portal hypertension. Probably this is uh, known to all of you. Size of the portal vein is important, but it's not specific. It may predict viruses. 
And now we come to the specific signs of portal hypertension. One is the stiffness, the rigidity of the uh, portal system and deep inspiration. When you take a deep breath inside, you change the pressure within the abdomen because the diaphragm pushes down and this uh, changes the pressure within the vessels and usually it enlarges and when you release the breath, it collapses. If you have pressure within the vessels, that is portal hypertension, then this remains rigid, rigid. You are not able anymore to compress it and even in baseline condition, it is already enlarged. So if these changes are below 40%, then you can make a diagnosis of portal hypertension. Normal condition, splenic vein changes, mesenteric vein, this is where you have to measure it, mesenteric vein or portal vein. Normal condition and this is portal hypertension. You see there is no change anymore between inspiration and expiration. The other specific points are portal thrombosis. If you see portal thrombosis, you immediately make a diagnosis of portal hypertension regardless the presence of cirrhosis. It might be total portal thrombosis which is about 2% of consecutive cases without liver cancer assessing your units, or partial thrombosis, which is about 4 to 5%, like this one, moral thrombosis, not occlusive thrombosis. And this immediately make a diagnosis of portal hypertension. If it is a long-standing history of thrombosis, you might observe a recanalization. This is a cavernomatous recanalization. You see that the portal trunk has remained completely occluded, but you have recanalization, and this is a sign of benign, long-standing thrombosis. The third specific sign of portal hypertension is the reversal of flow direction. In the splenic vein, mesenteric vein, and portal trunk, the flow must be hepatopetal, going towards the liver. But in up to 8% of the cases, either in the portal trunk or only in the mesenteric vein or only in the splenic vein, it might be reversed due to the development of large collaterals, which drain away the blood. In these cases, you make a diagnosis of portal hypertension. There is no other reasons for reversing the blood than portal hypertension. And if patients have portal reversed blood, this is this serious, they die as much as the others because this does not protect against liver failure, but they tend to bleed less because the blood is taken away from the varices. It's taken usually to uh, spleno-renal uh, shunts or... Uh, rectal varices. So you, you see that, for instance, the right portal branch, the color has become blue, the blood goes away from the liver. Often, when there is a reversal, the vessels are not enlarged anymore because they are somehow decompressed. So this does not mean that there is no portal hypertension, but it means that if you do, do not turn on the Doppler, you might miss the presence of portal hypertension. Last point that makes immediately a diagnosis of portal hypertension is the detection of collateral circulation. There are many, umbilical vein, spontaneous renal shunts, retroperitoneal circulation, gastroesophageal vessels, which are uh, acting as collateral vessels only when there is a reversal in the left gastric vein. Here is a umbilical vein, spleno-renal shunts. Last point, flow velocity. This is important, is a key element for making a diagnosis of cirrhosis. You have to measure it in the portal trunk at the crossing point with the hepatic artery during suspended normal breathing. Do not ask the patient to take a deep breath inside because this changes the pressure in the abdomen. And what happens in cirrhosis that you have a flat 
profile of the tracing and you have a decrease in velocity either be the mean velocity below 15 or the average maximum Maximum velocity be below 24 centimeters per second. In patients with compensated cirrhosis, a, de a strongly decreased velocity, like for instance a mean below 10 centimeters, is associated to worse prognosis, shorter survival. And last point, screening for early diagnosis of HCC. So to manage our patient, we should not only assess how much fibrosis is there, if there is portal hypertension, which means that we have to ask for esophageal um, endoscopy. We have to surveil patients, surveil patients for cancer. Why? Because patients who are screened live longer than patients who are not screened and who are detected for having cancer due to symptomatic cancer, for instance, or by chance. It might be argued that this is only lead time bias. The lead time bias means that you, when you perform a regular screening test, you detect the cancer early, so the time to death is longer, but the patient is not living longer. It's just that you make an early detection. So the question is, are these patients living longer because there is a lead time bias or they are allowed to undergo a better treatment? There is only one randomized trial run in China, in China. There are still some doubts on this quality, but this is the only one randomized, and there was a significant, statistically significant decrease in mortality in patients submitted to ultrasound every six months. So if you want, let's say, evidence-based medicine, we should perform screening because there is evidence for improvement in survival, which is not a lead time bias. So who should be surveilled? All cirrhotic patients, regardless of etiology, HBV or non-HBV. But if the patient is HBV, it should be surveilled even though he has not cirrhosis yet, but provided that it is male over 40 years of age or female over 40 years of age, or Africans over age of 20, because these patients were often exposed to aflatoxin and they are more prone to develop uh, liver cancer, and also patients with high HBV DNA. Whom should be surveilled? All childhood A, B, patients on the transplant list. No, no patients with childhood C, because the prognosis is so bad that they, if they are not transplant candidates, they would not die because of the cancer, but they would die of um, their cirrhotic, decompensated cirrhotic. Screening should be performed every six months. And, and last slide, one, what is, how is CUS connected? Once we detect a nodule, how can we make the nodule? We know that we are allowed to do, to, to, to do CUS, but should we do CUS? There are two manuscripts which have just come out this year. One is from our group, one is from the Milan group. Both made a costing analysis of which techniques are to be performed if we want to minimize the cost to reach a diagnosis and make an appropriate staging. It's not only a matter of, know of knowing if this is a cancer, but to make a staging of the patient. So it means that we always need to have also a CT or MRI because it's more panoramic. So if the nodule is less than two centimeter, I've told you that we, you need two techniques, either CUS, MRI, or CT. So it is cost effective to proceed immediately to CUS. So if you are in a center where you perform screening for ultrasonography, you see a nodule, then the best way to save money and also to give an answer immediately to the patients is immediately to inject contrast if you are able to. If the nodule is larger, then from a merely cost analysis, it would be better to go first with CT, alternative MRI if you don't have CT, because if you have the diagnosis, then you do not need other techniques because the nodule is more than two centimeters. But if you don't have the typical pattern, 
washout is missing or arterial phase is missing, then the next step should be CUs because this is the most economical approach. So I think that CUs has a role in this setting. I did not discuss about the role of CUs in making the diagnosis of cirrhosis. There are some manuscripts assessing transit time, but in my opinion, it is not worthwhile to uh, use this technique because it's not reproducible to make the diagnosis of cirrhosis as the tools that I've shown you are for sure better, probably more economic. I thank you for your attention.